Hello folks. At the end of the last tutorial I showed you some LEDs flashing but I didn't show you the program that did that. I have written a, a little indication here of how the flagged register is used and in order to set bits in it you use SBR and CBR and you set these values for the three flags that we're using bits 0, 1 and 2. You can test them with SBRS or SBRC and these are the bit numbers that you test. Following that we've got the vector table or the jump table as I called it. Then following that I've got a line that wasn't there before that I have put in. Now it starts with a label and in a program when you do a jump to a label the compiler uses that label as an address and that's what it's doing here as well. It's using this as an address. Now the program was written to do a specific thing. Uh, that it doesn't accept information from outside. It is written to actually flash LEDs in a certain sequence. So that sequence is written into the program and this is how it's done. We've got a declare byte and then these bytes are declared and these are the values that you have to send to port B in order to turn the LEDs on and if you look at the schematic you'll be able to see how that works. What we have here are the uh, LED numbers and they're arranged in a circle so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 something like that and these are the values that you have to send the port in order to turn those LEDs on. So that's written into the uh, into this line here. Now these are bytes that are being written into program memory but remember that program memory is written in words and a word is two bytes. If we compile this and we look at the flash memory we see we've got a lot of instructions here which are the same 1895 to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and then there's something else here and then there's some more of them. If you look at the program you see the first instruction is different and then you get all these 1895s and there's nine of them so if you look at this there's a different instruction and they're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So RETI is that 1895. So the whole of program memory is, is constructed in two byte words and a two byte word is usually used for an instruction but if you look for this here the 090A0C there they are 090A0C11 there's the 11 and you can see that these are written in bytes not as words because I needed to write in one two three four five six values there and I wanted to terminate it with a zero for the program to recognize that it had got to the end of the line I had to put in two zeros because it needs to have an even number of bytes in there because they have to fit into two byte words. In the program when we actually use them there's main that's all the uh, the setup and here's the actual program there there's not much to it. The first thing it does is it loads the Z register low with two times rotate one. Now rotate one is that label that we just saw. It's two times because it's got to convert bytes into words. So you might just remember that format for when you do the same thing. So the program is quite simple. It loads the Z register to point to the beginning of that string of characters. So it points to the 09. Then we have a loop label. LPM is load from program memory and it loads R20 from Z plus. 
the Z register is what we set up here and it's pointing to that label and because the uh, R20 is, is one byte it loads one byte from Z plus so from from that label and then it increments the Z register so each time you access it each time you uh, use it you increment it at the same time with a with one instruction having loaded it in we test its value to see if it's a zero to see if it's got to the end of the, the string if it is if it's a zero we do a breq a, a break on equal and that will go to r1b which does a jump to rot one which is up here that will so it's got to the end of the string the z register is no longer pointing to the beginning of the string so here we make it point to the beginning of the string again so we can repeat this loop if we haven't got to the last character so this breq fails in other words the the, the uh, execution just drops through it to here we say send to port b out is output to port b what is in register 20 and that is one of these values then we have a label saying wait one and we wait half a second by doing a little loop here so we we test the half second bit in the flags register and we jump back to wait one if it isn't set yet so we're waiting for that bit to set by the interrupt and if it hasn't set yet we just jump around those those two instructions when it eventually does set we drop through here and we clear it again and then we jump to r1a which is there and we reload the next led from the sequence and that's why the leds run around in a circle so that's pretty simple now i'm going to modify that in several ways just to rationalize the registers a bit i'm going to use register 18 as the flags register instead of 22 so f for find i'm going to replace all of the r22 if i click this little carrot to the left i can put the replacement in and i've already put it in there flag so i'm going to change all of those to say flag because it's the flags register uh, sorry there's the uh, replacement thing there so you can see all of those register 22s getting replaced with flag and i think that's the lot yes it's put a red ring around the r22 to say that it doesn't exist anymore and in here i'm going to write some definitions now the dot indicates a compiler directive like the dot over here this is telling the compiler to do something to put these these bits into memory at that label so the dot indicates a compiler director and this one is telling the compiler every time you see the word flag replace it with register 18 it doesn't actually replace it in your code but it does in the compile I've also told it some other definitions that we'll be using presently uh, loop count which will be register 19 and leda uh, the reason why i've said why i didn't just say led is because we're going to have led a and b la later on not yet though but led a is going to be register 20. now i've also modified this table here so instead of the values we had in here i've now got the values that we are giving it through equates dot eq says equate now a define will define a word as a register equate will define a word as a value so in uppercase we've got half second is zero four quarter second is ox02 and millisecond is 001 um, in lowercase and each one starts with an underscore i've put the underscore in because the compiler is not case sensitive so you've got to make some distinction between half second and 
half second because the compiler won't make that difference. So I put the underscore in for that reason. Uh, but the ones starting with underscore are the bit values 2, 1 and 0. So those are those values there. And I've, I've made this table here just as a reminder to myself in case I need to refer to it. Now when we read the program, we see that we are loading from program memory LEDA from Z+. We are sending to port B LEDA. It makes the program more understandable to read. However, I must tell you that it doesn't make a program more easy to debug, especially if it's somebody else's program. If it's your program and you have a reasonable amount of confidence that these things are correct, that's fine. But when you have a murder trial and they call in the police, everybody is suspect. And the same when you first come to a program that's got a bug in it, everything is suspect. It could easily be one of these definitions that is wrong. So when I'm checking a program for, for debugging, I'm constantly referring back to what the defines are and what the equates are to find out if, if they all work and then plugging them back into what registers are being used so that I can step through the program and see what's going on. Right, so we'll just compile that and single step it just to make sure that everything's all right. It compiled, so everything seems to hang together. So that's all working. Now I'm going to do some more modifications. I'm going to flash some different combinations of LEDs. OK, I have modified it. But before I show you the code, let me show you the effects. Oh, that's completely blinding my camera. That's flashing opposite LEDs, like 1 and 4, 2 and 3. That's the opposite sets, and that's all of them. In order to flash all those various combinations, I set up some different strings here. There's the original Rotate 1. There's Rotate 2, which is like opposite pairs of LEDs. Uh, rotate opposites. Um, opposite is uh, 1, 2, 3, then 4, 5, 6, and all of them is 0, 7, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is 0, 7, and then fox, fox is none. Well, I could have done it with one fox, I've set some extra bits. There's the original program which rotates single LEDs. Here's the next part of the program and it uses rotate 2. The next part of the program uses rotate opposites. The next one has just opposites. That's 1, 2, 3, then 4, 5, 6. This one here uses all and it flashes first of all all of them and then none of them. Now you can see that all of these routines are exactly the same apart from this here and the fact that I've changed the labels. This is R1A, this is R2A, R3A, etc. Uh, there it is, R3A. Um, so apart from the fact that I've changed the labels because every label in the program has to be different and that they're using different strings these routines are all absolutely identical. So the next thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to write a subroutine with only one of these and then simply pass this as an argument to the sub subroutine. OK, I've taken away all of those little routines. There's just a single one here now. And this is a subroutine. It starts with a label. We do a remote call to the to the label. 
uh, it executes the subroutine and then it does a return. To call it, what I've done is I simply load the Z register with the requisite string uh, and then call display and it displays it until it sees a zero at the end of the string and then it moves on to the next one reloads the Z register and calls display. So the whole thing is suddenly much smaller now but does it work? Well let's see. Right, now, in the last session, I said that I was going to explain how to light the forbidden pairs of LEDs by rapidly flashing between them. It's quite easily done by modifying the display routine. So what we do here, we load two LEDs at the beginning. So you load LED A from the string and then LED B from the string. Obviously, you have to arrange the string to activate the correct combinations of LEDs. So, we load two LEDs, LED A and B. Then, we send to port B, LED A. And then, we wait for a millisecond by waiting for the millisecond flag. When it comes up, we reset it. Then, we send to port B, LED B. And again, we wait for the millisecond flag. When it comes up, we reset it, and then we drop through, and we check to see if the half-second flag has set yet. If it has, we reset it, or if it hasn't, we jump to LP, and LP is up here, and we simply start displaying the LEDs again. So LED A, then LED B, and we display them for a millisecond each, and we keep on doing that until the half-second is met. When that eventually happens, we drop through to R1A, up here and we reload the Z register. So here's how it works. Now, I did also promise to tell you how to do this by using another function of the timer. It's very easy. Uh, nothing to be worried about, so let's just get straight into it. If we look at the data sheet, timer counter zero, you see that the first thing it says is there are two independent output compare units. There's output compare register A and output compare register B. There's a little diagram here that shows how they work. In this diagram, this is what I used for output compare register A. And you can see that this is the one that I've got set to 128. So the timer counts up, it reaches that register, it resets, it counts up, reaches that register, resets. Because we're in CTC mode, clear timer on compare. So each time it resets, it starts to climb again. But there is another register here, which they have um, set with various values. And each time it reaches that value, they are using that output to toggle a pin to produce a waveform output. I'm using it to generate an interrupt so that I can do things with the interrupt and control exactly what happens. I don't just want to toggle a pin. Here's the effect of it. Here's my timer counting up, one eighth of CPU clock speed. Uh, so it counts from there up to 125, its top limit, in one millisecond. And that is when it compares with output compare register A. If we use the other output compare register B, and we set it for exactly half, so half of 125, let's call it 72, then it will take a half a millisecond to reach this point. So, so this amount of time here will be 500 milliseconds. Now we will have an interrupt at the half millisecond mark and another one, a different one, at a millisecond. Now if we go back to the program, you remember from the vector table 
this is this is the vector that we're actually using timer compare match a and there is also a timer compare zero match b so we'll write a new label in here and we'll develop a new interrupt service routine to handle that interrupt right so what changes have been made well firstly we've got another R jump to a different handler when the compare match B comes up we've got some new definitions that I've noted in this table here OCR0B CMP for compare and underscore OCR0B CMP we have defined those two the, the, the table, of course, is all just a comment. It's, it's just a, a note to remember. We've defined those two in equates. So OCR0B compare is the 0, 8 to set the bit, and the underscore is to test the bit. We have a new interrupt service routine. There's not much to it. We save the status register. We set the flag OCR0B compare and then we restore the status reg. If you look in the instruction set you'll find that this setting a, a bit can alter the status register. That's why it's imperative to save it and then restore it. Over here where we previously loaded R17 with a 124 and then put it into OCR0A. We now load RC, R17 with a 62 and put it into OCR0B. And apart from that, in this first little loop here, we've got OCR0B now being set, uh, being tested, and OCR0B being set. And then we use millisecond. So we light LED A by sending it to port B. We wait for the count to get halfway up when OCR0 B triggers and then we light LED B and we wait for the full millisecond to be up. So the, the LEDs are now lit for a half a millisecond each but it doesn't really have much effect because we still wait for a half a second to be up before we load the next set of LEDs. When the half second is up, we jump to R1A up here and we reload the LEDs. When LED B is finally a zero, this BREQ fails and we drop through to R1B, come down here and we return and then that goes and reloads the Z register. Okay, let's see it working. Now, if we bring OCR0B, we'll make it not equal to 62 anymore, and we bring it down here somewhere, let's say equals 12 for argument. That will bring this line here across there and you can see that LED A will be lit for a much shorter period than LED B which will be lit for all of this period. That's very easy to do. All we have to do is put in here 12, compile it with F7, put my chip in the programmer, tools, COM6, it's compiled, disconnect the programmer, put the chip back in my circuits, And now what do we have? Well, we have pretty much what you would expect.
naturally if I set this in the other direction so let's say 12 away from 124 which is uh, 112 so if I set that to 112 and we recompile that put it in the chip This gives the interesting possibility that by varying the value of OCR0B we could fade LEDs from one to the next and I've tried it out. If you watch any one single LED you'll see it come on, get brighter, then get dimmer and go out again. When I was a kid at school, I remember that I could listen to the teacher in a class and understand what he was saying. But if I didn't exercise that knowledge, then after a week or so, it was mostly gone. And by exam time, it was pretty well all gone. So homework is crucial to school children. And I'm not suggesting that your school children, but exercise of what you learn is also very important if, if it's going to be useful to you if it's going to be permanent knowledge. So I think that this exercise of fading LEDs one into the other would be absolutely excellent for you because it will teach you much more than you think it would. You think that it's just a case of varying OCROB from zero down there up to 125 down there and that as you do so LED B will be lit for a very short period at first LED A will be lit for a much longer period so it'll be very bright and then as it goes on so LED B will be lit for more time LED A for less so it'll be getting dimmer and then LED will eventually go out now, this varying of OCR0B must be over a half a second, not over the millisecond we were looking at before. There's two different timing periods here. Yes, the LEDs are actually alternating on a millisecond basis, but here on a half second basis, we have to change OCR0B from its lowest value which is going to be close to zero and I'll come back to that in a moment up to its maximum value which is going to be close to 125. Now this shows all of the LEDs. Here's your physical LEDs on the board. Again your program LEDs and these are your physical LEDs down here. So when the program starts off in this first time slice from zero to half a second, LED1 comes on at maximum brightness. OCROB gets varied throughout that time slice up to half a second so that LED2, which is LEDB, goes from zero brightness to full brightness. When it gets there, You go back and you reload your LEDs from the string in memory so that now LED A becomes LED 2 and LED B becomes LED 3. So you get this one and this one are active now and again LED A is getting dimmer but in this case it's LED 2. LED B is getting brighter but it's in this case now it's moved on to LED 3. However, there are some gotchas. When OCR0B gets up to its maximum value, you want to set it back to, to how much? To zero? Well, in the program, you test your half second flag here. When it eventually has reached its maximum, we clear the flag again 
and we jump back to R1A, R1A, we reload the LEDs from the string. But all of this is taken, this is a, there's a few cycles involved here, there's a few instructions, and each instruction is generating cycles, remember, so that the timer counter, TCNT0, is counting, which means that by the time you get back to testing this, that you, you've changed the LEDs, and by the time you get back to testing this, TCNT0, the counter, might already be here. If OCR0B is less than that, then it will never trigger. Or, at worst case, you would have to wait for this to count all the way up to 125, for the CTC to initiate it back to zero again, and then at that point, OCR0B and TCNT0 will be equal so you might get a compare at that point. However, OCR0B should get set back to some value that is slightly larger than OCR0B will be at that point. So you have to go from this point here where you set your half second flag, set your timer to zero, and your cycle counter to zero, <clears throat> then step through it and find out what that value has reached by the time you start looking for it here and you have to look in your timer counter zero there's your timer and at this point here my timer is up to seven and if I had reset TCNT0 back to zero, it would be below that. So you have to bear that in mind. So those are your two main gotchas. The fact that it takes a millisecond to go through these two loops. Because it takes up to OCR0B to get through that one. And then the rest of the millisecond to get to that one. That would seem like a good time to increment OCR0B. But it's not, because OCR0B has to be incremented from approximately 0 to approximately 125 in half a second. But in half a second, you will have visited this statement 500 times. So you have to do something about counting it not every time, but every fourth time, because there are 425s in 500. So if you want to work on that, I really do think that it's an excellent exercise. There is another little routine that I wrote that you may find handy. When you increase OCR0B, you'll have to check that it is more than the a bottom value that you will define. So I would suggest defining two values in here, dot def. And maybe also um, define a count. So you would have three registers there. You would have to say equals registers of your choice. Then count would always have to be checked to be between the bottom and the top. If it's lower than the bottom, then you would have to make OCR0B equal to the bottom. If count is in the window between bottom and top, then you can set OCR0B equal to count. And if count is greater than the top, then obviously you mustn't set OCR0B equal to it. So you have to check that count is within the window of bottom to top. Now I, I wrote a little routine for that, and I'll put a copy of it below in the description and the routine is called between. Here's my little routine to test whether count is between bottom and top. The routine isn't very big, here it is there. 
this lot here is all just to to test it and here I have defined bottom top and count now this is actually quite a nice little example of the benefits of using symbolic values of making these defines and using symbols because it means that you could include this in any program that has bottom top and count defined and they could be any registers and the compiler will take care of that right folks you may well be feeling that by this time you've learned enough to start working on your own stuff to, to start working on your own projects and in that case that's great that's that's what the course was all about but if you do want to stay with me just a little bit longer I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I did on the timer in the next module uh, I'm not going to be stepping through it or going into it in a great deal of detail but I'll let you see some of the routines that I used uh, for example for storing stuff into the memory when when the timer has been set on that little that little gadget uh, it stores it into the program memory and storing into program memory is not straightforward so I'll show you that routine and uh, a little bit of arithmetic that I did uh, binary arithmetic that uh, that could be of interest to you yeah so I think we've probably got about 10 minutes on on the next module and apart from that well thanks for staying with me and uh, I hope you enjoyed it I hope you learned something and if you solve the the, the uh, fade out LEDs that I suggested put a comment in the in the comments below I'd, I'd like to see that don't put too much about how you did it because there might be other people behind you who would like to work it out as well but yeah it's been good all the best then have fun <laughs>